Good morning. It is Monday, June the 14th, and this is The Drill. Welcome to all the butchers, bakers, and candlestick makers out there. I'm Ron, your host and the only true conservative in the United States today. So this morning I'm going to offer up my daily declaration for spiritual warfare, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance, and then the Star Spangled Banner. After that, I'm going to be reading another segment. It's actually, a, a, we're going into a new chapter from the 30 Covert Emotional Manipulation Techniques. And uh, so we have that, and then commentary, and much more. All that when I come back. Thank you, thank you. I will deliver you from pride. I have delivered you from the spirit of pride, for by pride comes nothing but strife. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. It is better that you be lowly in spirit than to boast in your pride. My child, this is the one I esteem, he who is humble and contrite in spirit, who trembles at my word. Follow the example of my son, Jesus, who is gentle and humble in heart. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Humble yourself to me, and I will lift you up. Prayer Declaration I command all spirits of pride, stubbornness, disobedience, rebellion, self-will, selfishness, and arrogance to come out of my will in the name of Jesus. Your word has promised that although you oppose the proud, you will give grace to the humble. I submit myself to you. I will humble myself before you, and you will lift me up. Amen. And uh, so I like to uh, do the uh, Daily Declaration for Spiritual Warfare because, again, it uh, reminds us of what this all boils down to. The struggle, the fight between uh, good and evil, between God and uh, Jesus and the devil. So, uh, right now, we're going to have the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you very much. And now, the Star Spangled Banner. Oh, 
Thank you. That's absolutely gorgeous. And remember that it is only conservatives that can be patriotic. And that if you're not patriotic, you are not a conservative. So now we're going to the um, uh, chapter four. I refuse to have this discussion. And it's all about invalidation and how to deal with invalidation, which is one of the favorite techniques of the left. Quote, when we invalidate people or deny their perceptions and personal experiences, we make mental invalids of them. When one's feelings are denied, a person can be made to feel crazy, even when they are perfectly mentally healthy. R.D. Lang, M.D. Psychiatrist. And again, uh, no, they can't. He's ab- absolutely wrong here. Uh, Ayn Rand was right when she says you got to listen to your conscience. She didn't use the word conscience. She just called it the little voice. But that's what it is. Your conscience is going to dictate. You know you're right, and your conscience says that you're right. That's what you listen to. Okay? You don't go out and get validation. You don't need it. Okay? So listen to your conscience, and you stay out of this trap. An especially damaging form of emotional abuse, invalidation is the act of rejecting, diminishing, ignoring, judging, or making fun of someone's feelings. Unfortunately, it happens all too often. There even seems to be an epidemic of it in society. Um, Invalidation is insidious and often pervasive in certain relationships. When we've had our feelings invalidated, we know that something doesn't feel right. There you go. It's uh, that's your conscience talking to you. We know that something doesn't feel right, but we can't put our finger exactly what it is. Exactly. Uh, one reason it remains hidden is that many of us have learned to think invalidation is normal because it's so common. You may even do it to others. It might be common, but it's not healthy. Think of how often you've heard people say things like, it could be worse, lighten up, don't let it get to you, just forget about it, or you can choose to be happy. People invalidate others for a variety of reasons, sometimes purposefully and sometimes not. An abuser will use invalidation as a tool of manipulation and a weapon. Others may be short on empathy. Some may feel uncomfortable with your emotions or feel powerless to do anything to help you. Some are envious of you and will invalidate your achievements and the thing that bring you things that bring you happiness. It's not such a big deal or he's not really that great. You could do better. Are a couple of examples. So the one I used to hear in school all the time, if you told other students you got an A in a paper, they'd say, big deal, anyone could do that. And usually that's coming from a student that couldn't get an A uh, if his life depended on it. The bottom line is this. When you're invalidated, you're not having your emotional needs met because the person doing the invalidating is not behaving with empathy. Quote, one doesn't have to operate with great malice to do great harm. The absence of empathy and understanding are sufficient, unquote. Charles M. Blow. Um, Not necessarily. Again, you listen to your conscience. And if this person is invalidating you, you go somewhere where you're going to get validated, where people are going to uh, be able to empathize uh, with your emotions, if that's what it is that you're looking for. Um, And realize also that professionals can invalidate you. You go in to see a counselor, a psychologist, and thinking that, oh, no, they wouldn't dare do that. And sure enough, the next thing you know, you're being invalidated. I've had it happen uh, to me from various professionals from time to time. Uh, And because who's better at it than uh, the psychologist, the psychiatrist? Who's better? They know all the tricks. Empathy is understanding or identifying with another's feelings or difficulties and then conveying that understanding to them. It creates a sense of caring and mutual understanding. In other words, empathy connects people emotionally. It's also a bit of a trap. It's a power trap because um, as I'm reading this, it reminds me of the left. This is what the left has been doing for a long time. Uh, If you speak in certain ways, you contradict people, uh, then they will say, oh, you don't care, do you? And that's what they mean here is that you have no trying to suggest that you have absolutely uh, no empathy. And uh, so that locks you in, and and basically what ends up happening is empathy becomes whatever they want it to be. be, The definition becomes whatever they want it to be, whenever they want it to be it. And uh, the same thing with compassion and everything else. And uh, ultimately, uh, it may come down to, oh, you're not listening. So, and then in order to prove to people to try to prove a negative that you're not, um, what is it, how does he refer to here, Uh, that you're not um, unempathetic, okay, or that you're not not listening, so, you know, proving something to them, 
then you go ahead and find yourself inundated with political propaganda, forced to listen to and respond to political propaganda. It's a great trap. When you tell someone close to you that you're feeling blue about something and they say it isn't really isn't that bad. Now that's the, the different key. You your wife, your husband, your kids or whatever, they start pulling this kind of crap on you, then uh, you need to to call them on it. Excuse me, you're not being very empathetic. Maybe you need to wait. They're busy, they're stressed. You know, maybe you need to listen to them first then they get to ha- have emotional space as it were to listen to you, but the point is uh, that's a situation where you can feel free to call them on it. On other other occasions, uh, the idea is probably this is a person you just don't want to associate with. Go hang out with somebody else, you know. Um, of course not, because your feelings and concerns have been invalidated. Let me see. Oh, here. It, well, let's go ahead and go with the whole quote. It really isn't that bad. A lot of people have it worse, you know. Do you feel cared for, understood, and supported? Of course not, because your feelings and concerns have been invalidated. The other person has conveyed that they don't think your feelings are valid, so therefore they will not offer any support. As a result, you will not have your emotional needs met. And again, this is all comes back to uh, whether or not you're being invalidated. It comes back to your conscience. If the people tell you, because sometimes... Uh, we, we all do this. We make a meal out of something. We scrape our knee and we got to want to go on and on and on about it. You know, when, when we were kids and at a certain point you got to come on. It isn't that bad, <laughs> you know? And, uh, so if people are afraid to call you on that and say, you're overdoing it. Uh, you know, I suspect that you're trying to get something out of this. You're tr- you're milking it. Uh, that's a problem. Again, you then end up uh, trapped. So listen to your conscience, and your conscience will tell you. Um, sarcasm is another thing. People say, "Don't be sarcastic." And there's been people that I know that that have told me, testified that they are uh, the sarcasm has saved their life. That something somebody hit them with sarcasm at exactly the right point, and uh, it snapped them out of a. Uh, a very bad place in their life. So um, sometimes you need to be invalidated. If you're overdoing it, you're tr- you got an ulterior motive, but only your conscience will tell you that. Okay, listen to your conscience. If you're explaining how you feel to somebody and they say, well, it isn't that bad, and you're, the alarm is going off in your head, you need to go find somebody else to talk to. Okay, so... Uh, we all have innate emotional needs. If these needs aren't met, there can be serious consequences to our psychological health. Invalidation is no trivial matter. According to Steve Hine, author of the excellent and invaluable website EQI.org, invalidation is psychological murder or soul murder. No, it isn't. Like I said, as long as you listen to your conscience, see, you have free will. Uh, invalidation doesn't automatically, uh, invalidating your your, uh, emotions doesn't automatically invalidate you. Nobody else in the world has that kind of power. The only person that has that kind of power is God. If God is invalidating you, you got some problems. But the the rest of the people in your life, they invalidate you. Hey, you know what? Uh, I'm going to go find somebody else to talk to. Okay, another way, by the way, for people to invalidate you is simply to change, kind of change the subject, be vague, that kind of thing. Uh, I had a friend who asked me about uh, whether he was right not to marry a, a particular woman. And I told him, I gave him a straight answer. I told him exactly uh, that, as a matter of fact, he was right, and I told him why he was right. And he told me something interesting at the end of my explanation. He said, you know, I've asked all my friends the same question, and they give me this mealy-mouthed, uh, response: You're the only one that has given me a straight answer. So giving people straight answers is a way of validating them. Okay, if you mealy mouth your way around the conversation, this is as invalidating as saying, "Well, come on, it's not really that bad." Uh, let's see. Then we, he goes into our fundamental emotional needs to be acknowledged, accepted, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I'm gonna skip all that. We can determine the health of your current relationships by determining whether or not your emotional needs are being met. It's true enough. Invalidation needs to be recognized and taken seriously because it can uh, lead to mental health problems. But now we get into an adversarial situation. Only one person could be right. Who's it going to be? 
and you're going to get into a fight. And um, if you lose, what happens? You're invalidated as a person. You, you in essence, disappear. You become a zero. That's, a, that's an awful place to be. Now, if it's legit, if you find yourself in one of those once-in-a-lifetime situations where uh, that is, this is actually occurring, then yes, you're going to have to fight for your very life. However, uh, 99.9% of the time, it, it's not the case. It's not going to be something that's going to be soul-crushing, uh, as, he, as he puts it. It's going to be a lot more uh, trivial than that. Uh, let's see. When we experience invalidation, we defend ourselves either through withdrawal or counterattack. Repeated withdrawal, though, tends to decrease our self-confidence and lead to a sense of powerlessness and depression. Now, um, the left, when we're talking about withdrawal, that's one of the things the left wants us to do, uh, conservatives. They want us, they want to shut us up. They want us to decide, you know what, I'm not going to, I'm not going to bother to get involved in this debate. I'm not going to get involved in this discussion. I'm not even going to vote. That's their aim. So it's one of the things that you want to uh, be aware of. Uh, let's see. The following are examples of invalidating statements. I thought we already talked about that. I can't believe you're going to bring that up again. I refuse to have this discussion. You should be ashamed of yourself for feeling that way. And I, I got to take issue with I refuse to have this discussion. There's a lot of people on the left that want to go ahead and have a debate about whether or not 2 plus 2 equals 4. Literally. And I'm not going to have that discussion because uh, there are certain discussions that if you go agree to have them, you lose the argument automatically. Okay, any you argue about anything that is axiomatic, that is is self-evident, you lose just by agreeing to argue about it. Because when you if you, you say okay, let, let's uh, talk about two plus two equals four, you're conceding that maybe you're wrong, and that's uh, foolish. You should be ashamed of yourself for feeling that way. You need to realize how lucky you are. It could be worse. You shouldn't feel that way. Think about those who have it worse. Just don't worry about it. Get over it. Stop taking everything so personally. Get a life. That's definitely a left-wing thing. Lighten up, another one. Cheer up. Don't look so serious. I used to get that uh, all the time, too. You got it all wrong. Of course, I respect you, but I do listen to you. Uh, uh, that is ridiculous. Some of this stuff is not... They're not examples of being invalidated. Telling somebody that says you don't listen to them, but I do listen to you, is a legitimate, you're having a legitimate argument here. Um, that is ridiculous, If and if it is indeed ridiculous, then it's ridiculous. But again, it's your conscience that's going to tell you that. And same thing with the next one. This is nonsense. That's not the way things are. Fine, as long as they follow up and tell you the way things really are. Um, let's see, you're the only one who feels that way. That's a definitely an invalidating statement. You must be kidding. Can't be that bad. You're just tired. It's nothing to get upset over. And he goes on and on. Look at this, two pages worth of this stuff. Um, let's see, invalidation can also be conveyed without words. Nonverbal invalidation includes such actions as leaving the room, giving silent treatment, and rolling the eyes. This is a really, the whole chapter is really, um, really weak. Because, um, again, first of all, listen to your conscience and you'll know whether or not you're actually being invalidated or whether this is just part and parcel of having an argument. Okay, Not everybody in the world is going to agree with me about everything. So if I'm emotional about something, there's going to be, I might be getting maudlin. I've had people in my life that love to get maudlin about things, overly emotional uh, about things, especially when they have had a couple of drinks. Okay, so I'm not going to take that seriously. I'm not going to sit down with this drunk and, and to help him analyze uh, whatever it is that he's feeling maudlin about. Uh, the, Jerry Seinfeld had an episode about that, about a woman uh, who felt sorry for uh, inanimate objects, bananas and pieces of fruit. Oh, Mr. Fruit, oh, you fell on the ground. Oh, and she starts crying. Well, that's abnormal. That's not normal. You don't do things like that. You don't, you don't cry over spilled milk, literally. So, um, you know, otherwise, if you're approaching it the way the author is approaching it, anybody who motes is automatically correct and correct the whole time. It might be that Mr. or Miss Emotion is trying to manipulate you in various ways, shapes, or form. That's possible. 
So again, check your conscience and your con- let your conscience be your guide on that one. So uh, the next chapter is uh, number five, the most powerful motivator on the planet, intermittent uh, reinforcement. And uh, so we will get to that next time. But um, uh, we're going to be back in a minute here. So um, the a uh, little bit of current events here. Uh, Joe Zero, the guy who's running around the world pretending to be president of the United States, pretending to have presidential authority, is out actually embarrassing himself and embarrassing the United States of America. And I say thank you to all the people that helped him steal uh, the election. And I'm being sarcastic, of course. So uh, he went to a G7 meeting where he embarrassed himself. He had to be uh, straightened out by uh, good old Boris uh, in um, Great Britain. And um, he then went, I guess, to NATO, or he's going to NATO this week. That's the deal. And then he's supposed to uh, visit with uh, Vladimir Putin. And I I imagine that Putin is going to be laughing and laughing and laughing, if not in uh, the... Uh, Joe's face than uh, certainly uh, behind the scenes. Anyways, one of the things I want to say is as a true conservative is the way that uh, foreign policy should be handled is that uh, to face, number one, we got to face reality. And the reality is the United States of America is the, the only superpower in the world. We have not only the military might to pull that off, we have the economic muscle. Uh, thanks to Keynesian economics and the, the um Bretton Woods agreement, which makes the dollar the reserve, the world's reserve currency. That gives us a tremendous amount of economic clout worldwide. So uh, the problem we've had in the past is instead of acting like a world superpower, uh, we've acted more like a janitor. We have, uh, uh, every time something goes wrong, clean up on aisle five. People snapping their fingers, you know, uh, Vietnam was a classic case. Uh, France goes into Vietnam, screws up Vietnam, and then snaps his fingers and say, uh, Yo, garçon, uh, a miss, Mr. Miss America, clean up on aisle five. So we rush in to clean up their mess. No. If uh, the true conservative thing is we're going to be the boss. If there's a, a cleanup to be made and the French made it, the French are going to do it. Uh, I got this idea from uh, Somalia. Uh, back years ago, we sent troops into Somalia because there were all this warlordism that was going on and people were starving and it was a very desperate situation. Uh, basically, anarchy, except for warring, various warring tribes and whatnot. So we send the troops in and we're getting into constant uh, firefights. Uh, there's a book uh, written by a guy named Wasden who was a Navy SEAL and a sniper. And uh, so he was talking about what happened when we had what was called Black Hawk Down. He was there uh, when that happened, and he was uh, severely injured. And so God bless him and the other people involved in that. And what really, really torqued me to no end is he said that not too far away from Mogadishu uh, was an Italian military base. Apparently, the Italians had colonized... Somalia uh, back in, I guess, World War II. And uh, then after World War II, they, they, they had still had some kind of an agreement where they had a military base there. The military, the Italian military, provided no support, no help in any way, shape, or form. So here we are, the United States of America, expending lives cleaning up their mess. Somalia's a mess because the Italians invaded it. Okay, it follows. Now, uh, uh, that's ridiculous. That is obscene. So, if it, the true conservative position on this, 
when we have a Somalia is, gee, this was an Italian colony. Then we call the Italian government. We get their uh, their representatives in Washington, D.C. to go to the President of the United States, and the President tells them, it's on you. You fix it. And if you don't, there's going to be severe consequences uh, for you, uh, mainly in the media, in the press. And every time somebody asks about it, I'm going to say, talk to the Italians. Talk to the Italian government. Talk to the Italian people. It's their mess. They created it. They're going to clean it up. That's what I I call a foreign policy, not clean up on aisle five. That just doesn't cut it. So um, anyways, that brings me to the end of another episode of The Drill. And uh, I remind everybody to um, be honest, be smart, be beautiful, and remember that uh, the left has no authority, no power, and they can't win.